Hello, and thank you for joining the webinar. My name is Nathan Lowe of the American Probation and Parole Association. I will serve as the moderator for this event entitled Reducing Recidivism and Increasing Agency Performance. Successful collaborations between non-governmental organizations and corrections agencies in addressing reentry. Let me tell you a little bit about the National Reentry Resource Center. It was established by the Second Chance Act and administered by the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. The center provides education, training, and technical assistance to states, tribes, territories, local governments, service providers, nonprofit organizations, and corrections institutions working on prisoner reentry. It is a project of the Council of State Governments Justice Center, with key project partners including the Urban Institute, Association of State Correctional Administrators, and the American Probation and Parole Association. The center is also guided by an advisory board, which helps coordinate support and services for Second Chance Act grantees in the reentry field. Its overall mission is to advance the reentry field through knowledge transfer and dissemination and to promote evidence-based practices. This slide here shows a snapshot of the center's home page. The website is continuously updated with new content, and there is a monthly newsletter that provides information about the latest research, funding opportunities, distance learning events, and other news about the reentry field. To sign up for the newsletter, please visit csgjusticecenter.org slash nrrc after today's webinar. Also, let me tell you about a recent notable endeavor by the CSG Justice Center, the What Works in Reentry Clearinghouse, which was developed in partnership with the Urban Institute. It provides the public with easily accessible information about the research on topics related to reentry programs and practice. To check it out, click the What Works tab on the center's homepage, or just use the website address shown on this slide. Finally, let me briefly talk about the American Probation and Parole Association. APPA is an international association composed of individuals actively involved with probation, parole, and community-based corrections in both adult and juvenile sectors. Over the years, APPA has grown to become a for thousands of probation and parole practitioners. Educators, volunteers, and concerned citizens with an interest in criminal and juvenile justice are also among APPA's members and constituency. Please visit the APPA website as shown on this slide for more information about our specialized training, current projects, and forthcoming annual training institute to be held in August in New Orleans. There you, able, there you will be able to access the program and search the numerous training workshops to be held at the institute, including the workshops featuring one of our speakers today in relation to the topic of the webinar, community collaboration, the heart of effective reentry, how to build and sustain community partnerships. For your information, the workshop is scheduled for Monday, August 4th, from 1.45 to 3.15 p.m. We hope to see you there. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dennis Rance, Executive Director of the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency. So we'll introduce himself and his colleague and fellow speaker, Rob Burroughs, with Public Policy Associates, Inc. Dennis? Hello, everyone. It's great to join you today. Uh, I've been working in the criminal justice field for about 30 years. I've worked under three different governors in the state of Michigan, and I've been focusing most of my work on reducing prison and jail populations while improving public safety. As the director of the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency, I'm responsible for working with state and local jurisdictions that want to improve their justice policies, their justice systems, offender performance results, and achieve corrections efficiencies. I've served in uh, private industry, I have worked as Deputy Director of Planning and Development in the Michigan Department of Corrections, where I worked for seven years and oversaw the development and implementation of initiatives, such as a nationally recognized Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative that contributed to a 17% decline in the prison population, the closing now of over 20 prisons and a cost savings of over $350 million per year over the course of a decade, nearly a billion dollars. From 1989 to 1995, I was the founding director of the Michigan Office of Community Correction that was responsible for reducing admissions to prison under the state's Community Corrections Act. During that time, we saw a reduction in the prison admission rate from 32% to 22%, and it's been maintained at the lower rate for 15 years. For several years, I also worked in Wayne County, Detroit, Michigan, head of their Community Corrections Division, and we worked on a 24-year-old lawsuit 
against overcrowded conditions that we ended up ending. So I'm joined here today by my associate, Rob Burroughs, from Public Policy Associates. Rob? Thanks, Dennis. So by way of introduction, uh, as Dennis mentioned, I'm with Public Policy Associates. We are a public policy research development and evaluation firm based in Lansing, Michigan. Um, much of my experience is in areas of strategic planning, building effective collaboration, uh, as well as facilitating system changes to improve community safety. Uh, my current work includes partnering with Dennis and the, the Center for Justice Innovation to assist state and local jurisdictions that are working to improve their justice policies, uh, offender results, and corrections, costs, and efficiencies. Uh, in addition to that, prior to joining PPA, uh, I was Associate Director at the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency, uh, where I worked on several projects aimed at improving policies and practices within the, the criminal justice system, uh, including uh, building community capacity for the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative. Um, and that work was particularly focused on providing community groups uh, and agencies with the tools and technical assistance needed to implement evidence-based solutions for crime reduction and prevention. So we've got three objectives today for the session. First, we're going to discuss the areas of reentry that partnership between non-governmental organizations or NGOs and corrections agencies have addressed. We want to provide some illustrations, a framework and practice, and we want to discuss implications for future policy and practice. The beginning point for effective collaboration is using a clear and understandable, agreed-upon framework or paradigm for the work. The National Institute of Corrections, NIC, launched its transition from prison to the community initiative called the TPC in 2001. The TPC model, along with the policy and practice recommendations of the Reentry Policy Council, and other national initiatives provided a foundation upon which multiple states and jurisdictions have started the process to transform their approaches to corrections and reentry. As you can see on this slide, the TPC model defines seven key decision points organized across three phases. Phase one, getting ready. Phase two, going home. And phase three, staying home. These three phases span the activities inside prisons, beginning at the institution, leading to the transitional phase of going home immediately prior to the offender's release to the community, and then the third phase, community phase, staying home. What's important about the model is that it provides a continuum of transition planning programs, services, and supervision. It starts at the point of each offender's entry into a correctional facility, continues through transition, reintegration, and aftercare in the community. The goals of the TPC model are to, one, increase public safety by reducing the threat of harm by released offenders. Two, increase offender success by fostering effective risk management. Three, build accountability for the offender in system officials. And finally, four, enhance the role of communities and victims in the transitional process. There's several critical elements of the model, which include interactions with offenders are evidence-based, successful reentry is best achieved through what is called collaborative case management, system change is achieved through effective planning, and planning and implementation are collaborative. As you can see from this slide, the TPC model is a roadmap to improved reentry outcomes. The transition accountability plan or TAP process is the vehicle, and this slide illustrates this. The process aims to reduce crime by engaging all partners in a collaborative process that holds offenders accountable for their behavior and increases offender success. It is a dynamic process that starts at the time of sentencing and intake and continues seamlessly through successful reintegration and stabilization in the community. Key elements of this include 
The goal is behavior change. Second, interventions are individualized and comprehensive and based on validated risk and need assessment. Returning citizens are partners in the process. Teams are responsible for case planning and management and engage additional stakeholders as needed. Multidisciplinary teams are made of institutional or community correction staff and a mix of treatment providers, workforce development specialists, community resources, law enforcement, and others based on the specific needs of each offender. The team frequently reaches out and coordinates services with other stakeholders, including family, faith-based groups, and other natural supports. Finally, the transitions are seamless. In order to ensure continuity of key treatment and services, especially those that start inside the facility and continue in the community, teams managing cases inside the facility and teams managing cases in the community communicate and coordinate their activities. The primary tool for case communication and coordination is the TAP or Transition Accountability Plan. Available at a link that you'll see below, in the video player is a handout called Collaborative Case Management. This provides much more detail on the information that I just provided you. Moving on, as you can see from this slide, we stretched out the TPC and added a series of focused areas for change in your organization. While the TPC model has had enormous value as a foundation for effective strategic planning. Beyond that, the Reentry Policy Council report included policy statements and recommendations for planning through the development of sound evidence-based policy. The strategic planning for prisoner reentry framework, which is shown here, was developed through a collaboration of the National Reentry Resource Center, the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency, and the North Point Institute for Public Management under a grant from the Public Welfare Foundation and builds on the foundation provided by the TPC model and the Reentry Policy Council in order to focus beyond strategy and help build the capacity for operational improvements in policy and practice, especially as they affect both state agencies and NGOs or non-governmental organizations. The framework shown here is organized within the context of the overarching policy and practice considerations of transition accountability planning, case management, and evidence-based practices. It provides guidance for specific justice policies and practices that should be considered among 26 targets for change that are listed here to improve prisoner reentry. For each target for change, goals and operational expectations are provided, as well as references for further reading for specific pages within the Reentry Policy Council report. Finally, the framework facilitates an immediate focus on implementation for providing practical activities to help guide a jurisdiction's journey to meet the goals for policy change and operational improvement. You can see on your screen a link that will take you to a handout that describes the strategic planning for prison reentry framework in greater detail. Rob? So now to, to help illustrate uh, what it looks like when non-governmental organizations and corrections agencies collaborate uh, using a common framework similar to what Dennis just described, uh, we'd like to take some time now to provide examples from our experiences in Michigan and some of the other jurisdictions we've been able to work with. First, uh, to provide some quick context about Michigan's efforts, uh, the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative was launched in 2003 uh, and it was aimed at reshaping the entire process for how prisoners are prepared for release uh, and then supported and supervised through the transition from prison back to their communities. Uh, the model used to guide the transformation, again, was largely based on the TPC model uh, and the recommendations of the Reentry Policy Council that, that Dennis just finished describing. Uh, most importantly, uh, the development and implementation of the MPRI model was focused on creating and strengthening collaboration uh, both inside and outside of state government, uh, and that collaboration was built on a shared understanding of what really works to help returning citizens stay out of prison. Uh, the collaborative focus of the work uh, showed up at, at multiple levels, uh, including uh, 
interagency collaboration within state government between the Department of Corrections, Department of Education, Human Services, uh, Workforce Development, et cetera. Um, Public-private partnerships. Uh, the Department of Corrections partnered with uh, the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency and Public Policy Associates uh, to serve as, as the core statewide strategic planning group. Uh, and then most critically, uh, state and, and local partnerships. Um, and it was through these various relationships that the, the model was developed and, and the work really got done. Uh, so with that basic context, what we want to do now is, is just look at some key examples of, of how those collaborations function to drive progress. We'll start with uh, perhaps the most significant component of MPRI implementation, uh, which is the transformation of how the Department of Corrections engaged community partners, uh, both in terms of individual case planning and service delivery, as well as broader strategic planning to keep implementation of the model on track. Uh, if you look at the decision points and targets for change listed here on the slide, uh, particularly as we move toward phase two and three, things like uh, mental health care, education, housing, uh, these are all key services and resources which, for the most part, are, are situated outside of corrections. In fact, there really isn't a single government agency or, or even a private entity that can act on its own to transform all of the various systems involved across these targets for change. Instead, in order for significant and sustainable change to happen, uh, stakeholders representing each of these systems really need to share ownership for achieving these goals. Uh, furthermore, that ownership needs to start within the communities to which prisoners will be returning uh, and where they were either ultimately going to be successful or, or not. In order to not only uh, support community input, uh, but a significant degree of shared ownership and accountability among community stakeholders, uh, Michigan developed a common structure for community implementation sites. Uh, the structure was built around a couple elements. First, there was a steering team uh, made up of community stakeholders representing these key service areas uh, and led by four co-chairs, which included the, the warden of the prison from which many of the communities returning citizens would be released, uh, a local parole supervisor, a representative of the community agency that would be responsible for administering uh, any reentry funding received from the state, uh, and a community-based member representing the local MPRI Advisory Council, which I'll, I'll explain in a moment. Uh, the steering team's role is basically to develop, oversee, and monitor local implementation through a, a structured, comprehensive planning process. Uh, because the members of the steering team uh, were all, are all volunteers, uh, and have other responsibilities, other, other jobs, it was essential to ensure that this team has uh, adequate staffing and support. Uh, so each implementation site also has a community coordinator uh, whose job it, it is to staff and facilitate the local planning and implementation. Uh, each site also has a transition team. Uh, the structure of the transition team varies somewhat from, from site to site, but in general, they function as the case management team uh, to develop and oversee implementation of individual transition plans with each returning citizen. And then finally, as I mentioned a moment ago, each site uh, has an advisory council, uh, which tends to have broad membership and really intended to serve as the first line of engagement with the, the broader overall community. Uh, in Michigan, the statewide rollout of this community structure started with uh, eight pilot sites in 2005. Uh, which covered the state's major urban centers, uh, and then over the next couple of years uh, expanded to include 18 multi-county implementation sites that cover the entire state. So at this point, uh, I'll hand it back to you, Dennis, to talk a little bit more about the, the starting point for engaging community partners in the, the transition process. Thanks, Rob. The starting point in implementation in, in Michigan was not phase one, given the enormity of the prison population and the relative difficulty of changing policies and practices at that part of the system. But rather, we started at phase two, which included human service agency representatives from the local steering teams and reentry advisory councils that Rob described, who traveled to the prisons to meet with prisoners under a services that we called prison inreach. During the initial implementation of Phase 2, Prison Inreach, 
enthusiasm from communities was sky high as they had been seeking better connections with their returning citizens whom they often only met upon release when emergencies arose around housing and substance abuse challenges. All across the state, hundreds of community service providers began meeting with hundreds of prisoners, simply asking, what do you need? And then working to provide assistance to connect the prisoner with services to help reduce the return to prison rate by 6% in the very first six months of this initiative. So there's early discussions around the design and, and implementation of collaborative case-level transition planning during inReach. Of course, quickly expanded to incorporate planning and implementation of a collaborative case management process uh, that extended through all three phases of the reentry process, uh, similar to the, the diagram on, on the slide here on the screen. And although it might seem fairly straightforward and logical when, when presented in a diagram like this, uh, aligning the policies and practices across various facilities and divisions within the correction system, let alone coordinating those processes with other agencies and community partners, uh, is certainly anything but simple and straightforward. Uh, at each phase and each decision point, there are multiple players that need to be involved in ensuring that resources uh, are effectively coordinated at the case level uh, to reduce recidivism. Even within the facility during phase one, depending upon an individual's needs, coordinating and monitoring services may require involvement of health and mental health care staff, education and training, corrections officers and housing unit staff, maybe the parole board or releasing authority, uh, and, and many others. And that list only gets longer as the individual approaches uh, release date and uh, ultimately returns to the community. So to address that complexity and, and work towards seamless transitions, throughout the reentry process, Michigan dedicated quite a bit of time to developing a robust collaborative case management model. Uh, the model was based on a team approach to assessing needs, setting goals, and monitoring progress from sentencing uh, all the way through successful reintegration to the community. Uh, throughout that process, um, the Transition Accountability Plan serves as the key, really, to keeping everyone involved uh, and informed and holding the team, and, and importantly, holding the returning citizen accountable for achieving the agreed-upon objectives. Of course, uh, in order to accomplish that, numerous policies and procedures had to be examined and adjusted to support the new way of doing business. Um, for instance, it's one thing to create a TAP, uh, but that, that plan is of little value without a clear policy and process spelled out for how and when that transition accountability plan uh, is, is shared with key players. Uh, in addition, implementing the, the collaborative case management model required a whole new skill set uh, for prison staff and uh, field staff, uh, along with many of the community partners. Uh, therefore, the Department of Corrections worked with the contractor to develop a curriculum uh, and train a team of facilitators from within the department to deliver uh, it was really an intensive week-long training, which was followed up with supplemental coaching. Uh, the initial rollout of that uh, case management training uh, resulted in training over 3,000 department staff, both in facilities and in the field, uh, that had case management or, of course, supervisory responsibilities. Uh, importantly, the training also looped in many of the, the community partners. Uh, so considering the system-wide scope of change involved uh, in the shift to, to a collaborative case management model, um, these were just a few of the steps of a much larger and, and really still ongoing process of adapting policy and training uh, and then reinforcing new practices. So we turn our attention now to some of the lessons that we learned. You'll see on the bottom of your screen a link to a handout called Lessons Learned and we're summarizing those in the slides that you'll see before you. To begin with, these were lessons that were results of what Rob and I and hundreds of others accomplished in Michigan that were tested and expanded upon in the work that took place in 10 other states and jurisdictions under a major philanthropic effort by the Public Welfare Foundation and its project partners, North Point Incorporated, the Center for Effective Public Policy, the National Reentry Resource Center, the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency, Public Policy Associates, and state and local justice stakeholders from across the country. 
The lessons were learned were included in a publication developed for the National Institute of Justice several years ago. There's many lessons, but these are a few of the most important ones that we have uh, seen that uh, make sense wherever we work. Uh, beginning here, uh, understanding the political context of the work is important. Elected officials will ultimately make the decision to allow the executive branch to act tough and smart on crime. They need incentives in early successes to buy into the approach. When focusing on crime reduction and fewer victims, working with offenders is much easier to support politically. More and more, the political spectrum is moving in the direction of being smarter on crime due to the excellent work under the Second Chance Act, the Justice Reinvestment Initiative, the work of the American Probation Parole Association, the Council of State Governments, and the National Reentry Resource Center. The second lesson learned focuses on budget within the context of improved reentry. The work on offender crime and recidivism reduction is directly related to the national recognition that we simply cannot sustain the high levels of budget for corrections, and we must reduce incarceration if we want to affect those budgets. Michigan has achieved the largest drop in recidivism of former prisoners in the United States with an overall 18% reduction in returns to prison between 2005 and 2007, according to a 2012 report from the Council of State Government's Justice Center called State's Report Reductions in Recidivism. According to the Justice Center, over a longer period of time, Michigan's decline in recidivism is even more significant with a 28% reduction in returns to prison between 2000 and 2008. According to more recent data in 2013 from the Michigan Department of Corrections, the recidivism rate improved for steady cohorts of offenders by 38%. As a result of the improved outcomes of parolees, Michigan's prison population declined over 12% in just three years and has continued to decline to 17% over five years, the steepest reduction in the shortest period of time of any state in the nation. Subsequently, Michigan has also led the nation in prison closings and currently counts 21 facilities closed, saving nearly $1 billion over the course of 10 years. Moving to the next lesson, Rob? Yeah, the, the, the third lesson uh, is really about dedication to evidence-based strategies. Um, as discussed at the front end of the presentation, in order to improve public safety, it's critical that policy and practice decisions are guided by the evidence of what works to improve outcomes. Uh, obviously, an in-depth, detailed discussion about how to make that happen uh, is a little beyond the scope of, of this webinar today. However, uh, through our struggles in Michigan to implement and remain dedicated to evidence-based strategies, uh, we identified uh, we refer to what we refer to as uh, four cornerstones. Uh, that need to be in place in order to move toward an evidence-based system. Uh, the first of those cornerstones is to start uh, with, a fact, with accurate offender risk and need assessment. Uh, the second cornerstone is to focus on improved offender case management and work with one offender at a time to improve outcomes. The third is to implement success-driven offender supervision, uh, and that supervision that stresses the role of the supervising officer as a coach uh, rather than just a surveillance officer. Uh, and the final cornerstone uh, is to focus on agency-wide staff development and change management, uh, not just uh, training. Justice agencies really must become learning organizations and embrace the need to learn new approaches to reduce crime and recidivism. The next lesson is to focus on eight areas for core changes in the way that the organizations involved in improved prisoner reentry function. Corrections and parole agencies are complex, and it's difficult for leaders and staff to be able to effectively wrap their arms around the myriad of issues that are needed for sustainable system change. So by focusing on specific core areas of functions that are critical to the ability to sustain reforms over time is important. If capacity and competency within the justice agencies is needed, it's recommended to use outside assistance to help provide the skills and time needed to execute the needed changes. Some of those core 
Areas for change include attending to the mid-level organizational structure. Justice agencies must have mid-level managers who are competent and capable of overseeing the facility, field, and community work required to improve offender success. High-level leadership is critical, but changes must come from within the existing management structure. Champions must be identified who are willing to get in front of the initiatives and help develop them and then guide them through the trenches. Another core area is resources for staff. All line staff must have the tools and resources needed to improve offender success. Agencies must find ways to provide staff with incentives, rewards, technology, and training that will be required to conduct business in the new ways required by the system change for recidivism reduction. Technology is critical to free staff to work more closely with offenders so that offenders' attitudes and beliefs can be adjusted. Third, fully integrated policy and procedure. Justice agency policies and procedures must eventually reflect that offender success and recidivism reduction is not just a pilot or an initiative, but it's standard operating procedure. These reforms are really not about programs, although programming is important. They're really about fundamental changes in policy. Next, internal and external collaboration. Effective and strategic collaboration with probation personnel, prison staff, parole agents, and community-based agencies will be key in determining the short, intermediate, and long-term success of former prisoners. Community, faith, Law enforcement and victim leaders should not be an afterthought, but should be brought to the table as equal partners in the process. Sustained and long-term former offender success happens in communities, not just justice agencies. Next, budget alignment. To assure that the allocation of resources is consistent with policies and procedures, justice agency budget should be analyzed to determine if current expenditures are supportive of the new vision of improved offender success. Justice agency budgets have plenty of funding, and it really isn't about finding more money. It's about spending the money they have more efficiently and in ways that are more effective at improving offender outcomes. Next, assessment, measurement, and evaluation. To ensure that justice agencies develop and implement new and innovative ways to measure offender success and failure, more resources need to be allocated to evaluating and implementing evidence-based practices such as risk and need assessment tools that drive case management, and then evaluating their impact on crime and recidivism reduction. The next core area, engage other human service agencies. State and local agencies outside the justice system should be represented on a state and local policy team and included in efforts to promote offender success, especially when these agencies present barriers that work against recidivism reduction efforts. Offenders can only succeed when their needs are viewed holistically. Planning and implementation committees and councils should reflect that approach. Leaders in housing, addiction services, training, and employment and mental health should be at the table. Next, quality assurance. To ensure data drives decision aimed at improving policies, procedures, and programs on an ongoing basis, justice agencies must develop and implement quality assurance mechanisms that continually assess program fidelity, staffing efforts, and offender outcomes. This needs to be a formalized, fully resourced process. Rob? The next lesson uh, is to insist on local comprehensive community planning. In order to achieve and sustain the desired impact on recidivism reduction, community leaders must own the reentry initiatives and really be full partners in the process. And this ownership should have explicit expectations for engagement. Uh, as I described earlier in Michigan, the local steering teams were responsible for developing uh, and reaching consensus in a collaborative manner on a local community-based uh, comprehensive plan for prisoner reentry. Uh, the comprehensive plan was developed both as a tool used by the local sites to lay out the detailed strategy for multi-system change, uh, as well as a request for state funding to support that implementation. 
the content of that plan has evolved somewhat over the years, but in general, it starts with a community assessment that addresses specific service areas, such as housing, employment, substance abuse services, mental health, transportation, uh, and others. Um, and for each of these service areas, the comprehensive plan should describe uh, the local assets in place to increase the potential for success for former prisoners, uh, barriers that impede the maximum use of these assets, gaps in services, uh, and then, importantly, the proposed solutions to address the barriers and gaps. Uh, and that way, the plan builds on existing services uh, and embeds their use within the context of comprehensive service delivery. Uh, in addition, the plans were designed to focus on the policy and procedure that is critical uh, to implementation, meaning the who does what uh, and when for each of those steps. Uh, following up on that piece, the next lesson learned is to, to dedicate resources to local management and community coordination. So in order to accomplish and sustain that level of collaborative planning and implementation uh, within communities, um, local efforts at education, outreach, planning, and implementation require a significant amount of management and coordination. Um, as I explained earlier when describing the local structure in, in Michigan, uh, a community coordinator uh, staffs the collaborative planning and management process within each implementation site. Uh, those local community coordinators are the essential staff to the prisoner reentry process at Michigan's 18 regional sites as they are responsible for staffing the steering team and managing the development and implementation of the comprehensive plans. Uh, that, that function, whether it's a, you know, a single community coordinator or, or, or carried out by um, in some other structure, uh, includes a couple of key, key aspects. One is community convening to bring diverse stakeholders together and uh, build consensus and stimulate leadership and action toward reentry planning. Uh, another is community organizing to bring together uh, and train the steering teams and uh, facilitate reentry council meetings, uh, build those community partnerships, uh, and maintain written records of that, that entire process. Uh, another is brokering uh, to negotiate through inevitable community conflict um, while maintaining uh, a neutral stance. Uh, the next is uh, coordinating that, that process at the community level. And finally, uh, a focus on systems building to improve policies systems, resources, and services to support returning prisoners uh, and the community. The last lesson is very important and focuses on long-term public education and outreach. Frankly, nothing could have been more important in Michigan to prison diversion efforts and prison reentry efforts than continual public education. Taxpayers must recognize identifying the need for services and the provision of services as public protection strategies, not as coddling conduct. This requires a disciplined dedication of purpose that must be carefully developed, implemented, and managed. Reentry steering teams comprised of elected and other officials offer many avenues to educate the public and special stakeholder groups. Fundamental to community support, for example, is the support of law enforcement officials such as chiefs of police, sheriffs, and prosecutors who dedicate their careers to fighting crime. Their involvement in the local process as partners in the development and the execution of the public education plan is essential to gain and sustain their ongoing support. For example, in Georgia, where Rob and I are working, they developed a set of primary messages that will certainly resonate with the public. The Georgia Prisoner Reentry Initiative creates safer neighborhoods and better citizens by implementing a seamless plan of services and supervision developed with each returning citizen, delivered through state and local collaboration from the time of their reentry to prison through their transition, reintegration, and aftercare in the community. Public safety is the number one goal of the Georgia Prisoner Reentry Initiative, or the GAPRI. The GAPRI will reduce the number of crimes and the number of victims. It will reduce costs associated with crime. While no approach will totally eliminate crime, the GAPRI will reduce crime and the rate of those returning to prisons in Georgia. 
The reentry initiative is an approach that has been proven through three decades of research and incorporates evidence-based strategies. So those are the primary messages in Georgia. Secondary messages have been crafted as well. They are as follows. If you care about safer communities, you care about the successful reentry of your community's returning citizens. Research proves that successful reentry incorporates the support of family and human service agencies while focusing on a post release structure of supervision and accountability. The GAPRI focuses on prisoners who are already eligible for release based on Georgia law. And finally, the reentry initiative cannot determine an individual's release from prison. It is not an early release program. We recommend that groups of participants on this recording take some time and have some internal discussion about these lessons learned. Which of these are the most important or critical lessons to you in your jurisdiction, and why are those particular lessons important? That concludes our presentation today. We want to thank you very much for helping us. We want to particularly thank the National Reentry Resource Center and the American Probation and Parole Association for hosting this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis and Rob, for that uh, wonderful uh, broadcast presentation today. Um, at this time, um, that uh, concludes our presentation, and uh, we want to again thank everyone for uh, their attendance today. You should be able to access the slides and the uh, the, uh, the recording uh, on the National Reentry Resources website uh, relatively soon. So again, thank you very much for your attendance, and that concludes today's uh, webinar session. <laughs>